Sonic levels often structure the upper path as the optimal route, while the dreaded lower path is crowded with hazards and other style killers. Wacky Workbench flips this premise on its head, cause the idea is staying low as possible, and missing a jump launches you up to the ceiling for a clumsy climb back down. So naturally, this level's theme takes the soundtrack's recurring pentatonic walkdown to invert it on a collision course up to the roof. Strap your helmets, people! There's three types of platforms used to make your way across the bench, and it's these jobbies that cause the most frustration. If the light's blinking, it's a rotating one, and this will really mess up your jumps until you get the hang of it. From the start of section A, this melody twirls back and forth, whipping by in circles of threes on top of this 4-4 beat. Compounding the dizziness is this harmonized line not a fifth, but a fourth above the original melody, which is apparently a thing. But after enough missed jumps and ceiling crashes, there comes a moment where you've just about had it with these gimmicks. But the chords aren't going to help you get away any faster, structured in a way that reflects the present map's architecture. In your first few bouts with the workbench, missing a jump launches you up to the top of a narrow room, which you have to clumsily climb back down. In this whole ordeal, there's minimal horizontal motion, and in turn, the chords are locked in place for eight full measures at a time. This will change dramatically in the past, when the walls open up to allow for more navigation options, with the chords quickening to reflect it. But here in the present, we're locked in a static Dorian vamp of one to four that's held for eight measures. You'll probably crash into ceilings in other rooms too, so the next portion sets up shop on the five for a Dorian vamp there which actually results in a major tonic chord on that root of A. This chord pair is executed once more with the temporary tonic on the four. The future themes are set on this lower home base key of D. Low altitude is the name of the game in this zone, and by then Sonic's gotten the hang of avoiding so many ceiling collisions. But you're probably in the mood for some more active chord changes. And you know what? This zone is such an ordeal. Treat yourself to a simple peel-out time travel over the bench. You deserve it. Because the past is no cakewalk either. And it's not just the chords that change a lot more frequently. The twirling platforms melody is expedited too reducing the eighth note rhythm of each cycle from six notes to just three. This is the first thing to greet you on your arrival in the past, and like Ogata's past theme at Collision Chaos, it really captures the mental loopiness of breaking the space-time barrier. With the walls opened up, the chords are ready to switch every measure, and making sense of these progressions starts with a look at how chord harmony is handled in the genre of house music. By default, when writing a song in a major key, each note in the scale can serve as the root of a chord, which will result in a mix of major chords and also minor chords. But what if we decided to make these chords all major triads across the board? Doing this will start to bring in notes outside of the normal scale, so the progressions might start to feel weird, off, even wacky. And feel free to build chords on chromatic roots too, as long as they're still major triads. You can also apply this concept with all minor chords across the board. That's what Yuzo Koshiro did in Streets of Rage 2's first round. Check it out, all lowercase. House musicians came across this idea by sampling the sound of a single chord, then just pitch shifting it up or down as desired, regardless of diatonic expectations.
which became known as the Rave Stab. Look at this guy going to town on a sample pad. Press buttons to win. It creates the Red Bull energy of a 3 a.m. gathering in an abandoned warehouse, stumbling to the bathroom past graffitied walls and debris on the floor. So take a listen to the past workbench's four chords, and decide for yourself which ones sound weird. Could the strange sounding ones have been these two? Indeed, these are the two culprits making noticeable departures from the song's natural key. For this one, who should show up but Mr. Kirkhope himself, the sharp 4 tritone chord. That's when you build a full chord on that wobbly note between 4 and 5, which is the farthest you can get from the tonic in either direction, giving it that out there feel. And perhaps you notice the ninth chord at the start the same chord Ogata opened Tidal Tempest with. The last two chords leading back to this one chord actually comprise an Eggman cadence of 6, 7, 1. But each of these chords has a major 7th stacked on top, and on the last chord it breaks the diatonic boundary. This is the major 6th of the entire song, so it's outside the song's minor key. And at the end of this chord set, it's like that 6am feeling, where you should be tired and collapsed, but still have a wide grin enhanced by 6 hour energy and other supplements. So although the tonic chord is minor, the other three chords are all shaped identically with that major 7th, each transposed up by two semitones every time. All told, the composer didn't overload the track with gritty chords, but implemented a solid dose of house without overpowering the core sonic feel. Section B returns to the present structure of eight measure sequences, setting up shop on the five and four for more Dorian vamps there. This structure of repeating copy-pasted melodies succeeds on the wings of Masafumi Ogata's approach to composition. Even though all eight phrases are identical, they still somehow feel like they're advancing the progress without boring the listener, especially with the excitement of knowing that the end of this eight measure countdown will launch back into that inverted pentatonic shot upward. So let's raise a glass to Ogata-san while taking in all eight measures in full. The Sonic CD composing team also worked on 8-bit Sonic 2 soundtrack, where Ogata first composed the music for Green Hill Zone, effectively serving as a demo for what would become Sonic CD's main theme, You Can Do Anything. It's not confirmed who composed Aqua Lake Zone, but there's a strong case for Ogata in this melody that repeats for literally the entire track. The case grows stronger when this exact rhythm appears again in the workbench's bass, and in the same key even. This exact aqua-like rhythm appears only in the past, where Ogata installs this parallel to his past composition. But the other eras, including the good future, tweak it to something resembling the Angel Island Act 2 bass line that was due the following year. The twirling platforms melody is still part of the equation, but operating more in the background and in the higher register. The note structure is the same, but rather than the dizzying rotation of previous eras, now it sounds more like busy robots doing helpful tasks in the distance. After all, the original name for this zone was Crazy Toy Box, 
and this chorus of bells has a Christmas morning energy. Which would make this a Robotnik fulfillment center to compete with Toys R Us. And the vocoder voice from the time travel signs shows up in the present theme's intro measures to say crazy toy box outright. But you can play with future toys once you earn them. Real talk, you're probably not going to get the Act 1 generator on your first playthroughs. So Act 3 is going to be one big techno mega hell. The rhythmic dissonance sounds like the whole joint's about to self-destruct. The sirens yell every three-quarter notes, fighting against the song's 4-4 measures. And of all time eras, it's the future tracks that take the twirling platform melody and break the constant barrage of 16th notes, with a rest right at the end. It even has echoes of that Christmas melody, but shaved down to just the most important tones as whole notes, which still manages to include that major sixth. But far from being a wholesome Christmas, this bad future brings in hell elements, or elements. You know that demonic voice effect where you take a voice clip, duplicate it with a higher and lower pitch, and then play it all layered together? If we go through those three giant rings together, we will earn bonus points. Well, the bad future implements this effect on the synth that plays that pentatonic walk-up from before. And it goes hard in the rave-stab breakdown, similar to Ogata's bridge in Tidal Tempest Bad Future. But this time, instead of parallel fifths, there is exactly a minor third between all the note pairs. But while partygoers danced through the night in actual USA, Spencer Nielsen was busy tuning up his guitar for that country's soundtrack. The bass line that starts off the song is one of those pentatonic riffs you bang out quickly at the beginning of a jam session with pals. Section B brings in some ska action, with its reggae-style syncopated guitar chords at a speedier tempo. It's not often you encounter a legit three chord in the wild. Some newer music theory students assume that this three chord minor triad should be used frequently, since it does seem to be a natural starting point for a multi chord circle of fifths pylon. But more often, hearing that three in the bass just turns out to be part of an inverted tonic chord. You know what they say, if you hear a major three on bass, look for the one. And for all your efforts, when you make it to the good future, you'll be met by hard labor. This sounds like hard labor. I liked it when the robots were doing tasks for us in the background. And this is for the good future? Did Spencer mislabel the tracks in his final submission to corporate? These stutter notes on guitar sound cool enough, but they have nothing to do with anything. The other future track may have been mislabeled too since Hawaiian luau's are often associated with desirable results. Throw in some cowbell and some guitar noodling, and you have a song that was definitely completed in time for the seven week deadline. This is a level that's supposed to be nightmarish and aggressive, with sirens screeching cause you done messed up. You would be opposed to the US soundtrack's music swap 
if you are similarly against swapping out the Shining soundtrack with chiptune jams from Chuck Rock. Imagine if you bought Sonic 3 in 94, but Hydrocity Act 2 swapped in a totally different composition from Act 1, deeply at odds with the atmosphere created by the game's designers. Then imagine it was re-released on GameCube in the 2000s, with the actual soundtrack suppressed. Again. Listen. Hataya and Ogata poured themselves into numerous revisions of tracks, taking direction from the very specific vision of Sonic's original designer. Naoto Oshima, who's also the showrunner of Sonic Superstars. For inspiration, they dove into current American music trends in hip-hop, New Jack Swing, and of course house music, pioneered by Chicago's own Frankie Knuckles, the godfather of the genre. But SOA had a fancy recording studio at their disposal, and the suits wanted to use the company's payroll. Enter the navel-gazing Dad Rock. Which is maybe part of the reason I thought this game was kinda whatever when I first tried to play it on Sonic Gems, and the bench was the level that I gave up on. But now this zone is one of the highlights, and Yasuhara would never design Wacky Workbench, because he can't see Oshima. Except when they hang out. Ah, the bouncy bench. Just like the tether in Knuckles Chaotix, what first seems like a clumsy inconvenience emerges as a powerful mechanic to be harnessed. <laughs> 